uh, introduce Lisa, that I think I have known ever since I started doing math biology. And so Lisa did her PhD at Quran with Charles Peskin, and she's been at Tulane University for pretty much ever since. And she just came back from a year of sabbatical, being traveling the world, being in Vietnam just a few weeks ago, or a few days ago, I should days say. Ago, I'm a little tired. So right now it's like 4 a.m. Something like that. Okay. Um, and also, Lisa has been elected as the new president of Siam Elect, and have been really an inspiring person working on biofood dynamics over all these years making math biology one of the really prominent subjects that it is today to really try and say we need to put more of the biology into the math to actually describe what happens. And it has also led to a lot of new interesting approaches to solve the fluid dynamics equations that she's been working on on the small things, swimming and flying. So, welcome Lisa. Thank you, Meta. It's great to be here and to see some, so many of my old friends and to meet um, some of the new students who are, you, you got, uh, I, I hope the students recognize what a wonderful applied math program you all have here. It's very special. And I also hope you recognize that the quality of your, your snacks at tea time is pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I will see. So what I want to do today is to tell you about a couple of problems that in biofluid mechanics that our group has been working on in, uh, in elastro -hydro hydrodynamics. So I, I will ass assume that you, you know some fluid mechanics, but, but not much. So let me go through this right now. So just to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, uh, here outlined with their names highlighted in red are the postdocs and the students that really did all of the work. And um, let me move on from here. So for many, many years, I have been studying the fluid dynamics of tiny organisms. And it's, this has really received an awful lot of interest recently in the, in the, in the past decades. So what, what, do, what do you see here? Here you see some mice sperm swimming across the screen. And here we'll talk a bit about bacterial uh, flagella. So why has it, there, I, I've, I've gotten to, to witness the resurgence or this uh, renaissance of studying microorganisms. When I first started doing this years ago, it was a kind of a, 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 you know, a, 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 a nice side job and there were very few people interested in it. So that was, that had its good points. But with the advent in technologies, both computational and just in engineering, there are, there's this resurgence of interest because of the possibilities, the intriguing possibility of engineering nanorobots or, or tiny mi microorganisms which can be directed somehow, for instance, to deliver, uh, d deliver uh, chemical agents to a tumor, perhaps. So this, the idea of, of fabricating these tiny robotic microbes and directing them through fluids or through tissues to deliver, deliver their package uh, brings about all questions of fundamental fluid dynamics of how tiny things move through, move through fluids. And on, on top of that, the, the, other, uh, the other main uh, the, the other technology that's been advanced in the past two decades, for instance, that wasn't much around when I started doing this, is microfluidic devices, where you could really create a controlled laboratory on a, on a chip at the, at the micro scale and measure um, fluid properties. So, so what I'm going to talk to you about Today, one of the problems is looking at bacterial motion. So, here, what you what you see, these are E. coli cells, and this these are uh, these are images that are I took off of uh, Howard Bird's uh, labs page. Here, these are E. coli, and an E. coli cell has many fl flagella, 
and they are they rotate by a motor embedded in the in the cell body. And when these are all rotating in the same direction, uh, the multiple flagella form a coherent bundle. And uh, and the whole bundle rotates in a particular direction, and the cell body rotates in the opposite direction, and you see this swimming. The way these kinds of bacteria reorient or perform chemotaxis is that occasionally one or more of the flagella will rotate in the opposite direction and cause a tumble. You see that over, over in one of these images where that uh, the, 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 uh, when the flagellar bundle is no longer coherent, uh, it, instead of going in a straight line, it changes direction. And that run and tumble is a, is a, is a mechanism for this bacteria to, to, uh, to go, for instance, move up the chemo, uh, chemo-attracted gradient. So the project that I'm going to first talk about is currently funded by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So some of you, you most of you will remember that there was a, an oil spill in the Gulf uh, by BP uh, a few years back, and so BP has put some, uh, given some funding to study, uh, to study topics related to oil spill remediation, for instance. So I'm working with a group at Tulane who are studying um, bioremediation, whereby bacteria can ingest toxins like oil, for instance, and render it harmless. So what is so? This is from a lab, uh, and our collaborator uh, Kyriakis Papadopoulos, Kyriakis Papadopoulos's lab, where we're looking at um, bacterial motility through complex media. So what you're seeing here, this is it in a this is in a capillary tube, and this is cryolite sand particles. So these big things here that you see are are some type of sand particles. And you can see these bugs moving, these bugs there's uh, there's I think these are bacillus bacteria. They're moving through pores between these sand particles. So you know uh, obviously, when uh, bacteria are introduced into into uh, into the Gulf or into in, into the, the soil, they're not moving through open, uh, clear Newtonian fluid. So they are moving through complex environments. So one thing that we would like to understand is how to direct motion of these bacteria through confined environments like the pores between sand particles. And so we're asking a, a one, one question that uh, people have asked even years ago is how does bacterial motility change when they're moving through tiny spaces? So I showed you before the image from Berg's lab where the, the, the E. coli was just moving in all different directions, running and tumbling. So many years ago, um, Kyriakis in his lab uh, looked at E. coli motion in these tiny capillary tubes. And while this movie here is not going to win an Academy Award, it is a really uh, interesting thing because what you see here, this is about three microns long, what you see are the cell bodies of E. coli. And what I want to point out is that you don't, you, you see unidirectional motion, basically. The cells aren't changing direction and tumbling and moving off in, a, in another in other ways. So it's, it's kind of, a, it, it's, it, it's just, I don't want to use the word common sense, but I, but I, I will. There's not enough space for them to ch change to turn, right? So while we can't visualize the, uh, the flagellar bundle coming apart and reorienting up here, we can only see the cell bodies, you can imagine that, that there's not enough space to, to, to do this reorientation. And this paper, Kyriakis did this work in, I, I can't see the year, but 1995, a long time ago, before 
before microfluidic devices were were uh, so uh, readily available. More recently, <coughs> in 2014, uh, there's, there have been experiments that show that there's this steric hindrance that's not allowing the, the uh, bacteria to reopen. So that is one of the things that we wanted to study, uh, directed motion of bacteria through these porous media ma matrix like I showed you before. And I'll show you what, uh, where we've gone to so far. <coughs> so we would like to study this as a mechanical system. So, uh, and, and we want to first certainly model the environment with where we're at. So we're going to first look at the fluid equations and then your Stokes equations where are just Newton's second law, mass times acceleration equal applied forces and the flow is incompressible. If you do the relevant scaling, where you look at the, uh, the, the typical uh, representative velocity, length, density, and viscosity, uh, the Reynolds number for, which is the, the non-dimensional quantity that, that governs uh, incompressible flow here, the Reynolds number for swimming bacteria is very tiny, 10 to the minus fourth. Inertia is not important at all. So this, the Reynolds number measures the ratio of inertial forces and viscous forces. And so the beauty of uh, low, uh, the, the beauty of swimming at the micro scale is that the Reynolds number can be taken to be zero. And when you rescale it, you get uh, you get the Stokes equations. And so, what? do the Stokes equations tell us. So here P is pressure, U is velocity, and F is some applied force. The vergence of U is zero tells us that the flow is incompressible. But what are the Stokes equations? So here, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how the, you know, the Stokes equations are, are kind of bizarre and always, uh, when you think about it, it's, uh, it could confuse you, and they've confused me for decades. So what is this? This there's no there's no time derivative any longer. So here, what we what the Stokes equations tell us is that ev at every instant, the forces are in total balance in equilibrium. So here, at every instant, this, the forces are in balance. But if if the, if the applied force is time dependent, here's where your time dependence. So the Stokes equations, the first, they, they are linear. So there, there's the, the, the effective term in the Navier Stokes equation is gone. And the linearity of the Stokes equations allows us to use uh, techniques like fundamental solutions in numerical methods. So for instance, look at the case where we have a single delta function point force applied at a fixed point x0. So here, uh, imagine that f is a constant vector. We're applying force at a single point. And so here, delta is the Dirac delta function. So here, one can use classical methods to solve this exactly. And here, we get the, the fundamental solution for the Stokes equation for this single point force is Stokes slip. It has a 1 over r singularity in the sense that if we evaluate the velocity due to a point force at x0, at, if we evaluate it at x, which is a distance of r away from x0, here is our solution. The problem with this Stokes slit solution is that if we evaluated the velocity at the point at which we were applying the force, it would be singular. But the fact that, that this is a 1 over r singularity and we're applying, perhaps applying forces on a surface, the 1 over r singularity is integrable and we can still write down the solution. So what I'm sh so many of the students perhaps have seen this in their graduate fluid dynamics class or graduate applied math class. This is a classical solution to the 
Stokes equations. So, two questions. What I showed you before is that is is a force, a, a constant force applied at a single, at a, a fixed point. So, what happens if the surface along which the forces are being exerted is actually actually moving with the flow? And what if that force also depends upon the evolving configuration? So, here then. Now I'm I'm putting a summation of forces here. But now I want to write, the, I want to look at the Stokes equations where we have a collection of forces, but the forces themselves are not constant. <coughs> they depend on the evolving configuration. So think about this, when I say the evolving configuration, imagine <coughs> that this flagellum is made out of a bunch of points connected by springs, and, and each one of those springs are elastic and has a certain rest length and a certain stiffness. So the force, as, as, as two nodes connected by a spring move, uh, the force that, that the spring is generating changes. So here, so imagine we have forces that are uh, dependent upon the configuration, but at the same time, the configuration of these, of these nodes, perhaps that make up the flagellum, are also moving at the flow with the fluid velocity evaluated at that point. So this is more of a reflection of the coupled elastic fluid system. And even though the Stokes equations are linear, the, the problem itself is, not, is now a nonlinear problem. Not in the, yes, U appears only linearly here, but because the places at which you're evaluating the, uh, where you're applying forces are moving with that fluid velocity. This is where the uh, system becomes interesting. Okay, and so we're going to uh, then use this idea to model the, the coupling of a Stokesian fluid, no, no inertia, with an object, think bacterial flagellum, that uh, is elastic. So. Here, the numerical method that, I, that I'll just briefly tell you here is based upon a regularization of the Stokes equations with, instead of a Dirac delta function force, what we do is instead apply a force not at a single point, but at, but some at, at uh, near a point with, with over a ball of, let's say, radius epsilon. So we take the point force and spread it out a little bit. And so we, we, you could think about this epsilon as a numerical parameter that should go to zero if you, if you are discretizing a surface. In some cases, if we're discretizing just a flagellum, we think about this regularization parameter as being the radius of the flagellum. So here, for certain choices of these, of these blob functions, like this one here, one can analytically write down the solution to this regularized Stokes equation. And uh, here we, we've written this down. You can see that the regularized Stokes split, uh, as epsilon goes to zero, uh, uh, approaches the classical solution. So this lends itself very nicely to a numerical treatment. <coughs> Because we don't, we don't any longer have to worry about evaluating the fluid velocity near where we are applying the force and having things blow up. It's, it's regular. Okay. So let me show you. <coughs> so but I'm, I'm going to talk about what we thought was going to be a nice warm-up problem for our postdoc, John McGrone, who came to work on this bacteria and porous media chemo-attractive problem. So we said, well, first let's look at, instead of the flagellar bundling, let's assume that this helical flagellum, the flagellar bundle, is just one helix. And let's see what happens, for instance, if we make it elastic, so not a rigid object. And let's see what happens if we just rotate it by a rotlet at its nose and see how the swimming depends upon how stiff the flagellum is. <coughs> And the other question that we asked is, how does 
just the motility of this single helix change when we when we apply a given torque? How does its swimming change if we put it in a cylinder? Okay, so the, the, these are simple questions. I thought that we might work on this for a month, and you know, we've been it's been longer than that. It's an int it's an interesting problem, and I'll try to show you why. So here's how we modeled this system. So we have a helix. We are actually discretizing the surface of this helical tube. So think about it as, as a tube here, where we place individual nodes or cross sections of this tube, and we connect a whole. We connect them by springs, where, where we let's imagine this: you build a helix, and it has the shape you want. You put a bunch of nodes on cross sections of this helix and that is the shape that is the that is the equilibrium shape we want to keep we compute in its equilibrium shape the distance between nodes and we use those as rest lengths and we endow each one of these springs that are making up the surface with a certain stiffness constant to tell us the material properties of this helix so given that we, so we, we, we build the flagellum. If it was in its equilibrium configuration, there would be no spring forces. But if for some reason, because of its coupling with the fluid, it moved a little bit, there would be restoring forces from these springs asking to bring it back. The other force that's going to be driving it is, is a rot rotation force or a rotlet at the front of the helix. And in order to conserve, uh, in order for this to be a force-free system, we didn't, in this warm-up problem, we didn't want to model the cell body, so we just placed a virtual cell body in front of it where, where we applied the opposite, uh, the opposite torque in front. So everything sums to zero. And then we couple this with a fluid. Okay, so, so you, you get this. An undergraduate could code this up in a day. It's a very simple numerical method if you have your regularization function. You apply forces, you use the formula, you compute velocities. You update all your points at those at that velocity at the velocity, you have a new configuration, you have new spring forces, and you can continue. There are some subtleties that I'm not going to tell you about. Here is, here is a simulation, and what you see is the following. I believe that, that this is a, it's a two-dimensional slice. The helix is rotating into the board, and in front you see this virtual uh, cell body here that's rotating in the opposite direction. This numerical method does, is not finite difference or finite element. The only thing that's being discretized is the helix. We, I, because we have this fundamental solution, we can evaluate the fluid velocity at anywhere in three space. So we're just denoting the fluid motion by uh, at points on a plane. But these points on the plane are not used in solving the system. So all the, all of the action is here. And so you see this guy. So in this case here, I am not showing that this is in R3. This is in unbounded space. So let's see. So now I'm taking, here is a simulation where, what well, there are seven different simulations where we're taking the same helical shape, same equilibrium shape, and driving it with rotlets of increasing strength from one to seven. This is non-dimensionalized in some way. So as you imagine, if you spin it faster, it's going to swim faster. If this was a rigid helix that had no elasticity, the rotless strength of seven should swim exactly seven times faster than the rotless strength of one. But there is, if, if you have a good eye, you may see that the shape of the helix, the helices are not exactly the same at all, and I will come back to that. Because 
there is elastic coupling here. In each one of these, in, in, in each of the seven simulations, the stiffness or the, or the bending rigidity of the helix is the same, but it's not infinitely rigid. So here, uh, what I want to point out is this. So here, uh, we could compute the speed, and these different k's are, these are the stiffness parameters. So think about this as some Young's modulus. So, so k equal 1200 is the, is the stiffest, k equals 75 is the most flexible helix. So here, uh, this is, uh, here, let's look at this picture here. The Rotlet strength varied from 1 to 7. But how much, or we could ask the question, the average distance per, revolu per one revolution. If this were a rigid object, it should be constant, because this is Stokes mode. So for the most rigid helix, we see that it's almost constant. And for the most flexible one, it certainly is not. So we see as the stiffness decreases, the floppier helix certainly as, as, as the helix gets floppier, the distance per revolution actually decreases. So let me just show you what's happening here. Much of the motivation of, of my research over the decades has been the, the, uh, the appeal of the uh, of figures here. So here, I, I think this is a nice artwork here. So what am I showing for you? This is at some particular time, these are two snap, each one has two snapshots of the evolving shape. So you see here, Rotlet strength is zero. That means that nothing's moving. It is always in its platonic equilibrium shape. That's what this, that's what, that's what the springs are trying to make it, the shape that it wants to have. But you see, as it gets uh, rotated faster and faster, you see the shape changes. For the for the, for the case of the Rotlet strength of 7, you see that the wave number has increased and the amplitude is smaller. Yeah. When you say the Rotlet, are you talking about the cell body at the front that you're altering the velocity yeah, so, of? Well, or? yeah, so the way that we're doing this is we're, we're like the hand of God coming in and spinning the first section of the helix. Okay. But because that's not, uh, you need to have total force equals zero. So a real bacterium helix spins in one direction and the cell body spins in the opposite direction. Okay, so you are the thing that you the parameter that you're varying is the the speed of the actual helix. The thing that I'm varying is the is the strength of the torque that I'm applying at its nose. Okay. But then I also apply the opposite torque On a the little cell. further out. Okay. So so here you can see the elastro hydrodynamic coupling. Now, uh, this is this is not the the first problem that uh, that has been studied in elastohydrodynamics. Uh, flexible fibers and shear flow and other things, where you 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 have a competition of different types of forces. You have fluid forces and elastic forces. So um, this uh, is lovingly called this non-dimensional quantity, but we call the sperm number because people who are studying sperm motility wanted to look at, for instance, the ratio of viscous loading forces to elastic bending forces. You could also interpret it as, as the ratio of the bending relaxation time to the, the period of the rotation. And so sperm number, effective viscosity, effective flow forcing, and so on here, this tells you about the, the elastic hydrodynamic coupling. And when we look at that, so for each run that we did, most in the graphs that I showed you beforehand, we varied the stiffness of the helix, and we also varied uh, the rotation rate. We could then compute, what, we could see what sperm number we were actually computing at. And so it could, it could be that different runs were exhibiting the same sperm number the same non-dimensional quantity. And when we do that here for all of these different run, these, these runs of different colors, one for helices of different stiffnesses, we see that the, the results, the distance per revolution, collapses very nicely as a function.
um, for this um, Routlet, for the, for the stiffest case, the average distance per revolution should be constant. And you can see that it's approaching it. But one thing that I, that I wanted to point out here, in these, in these um, graphs where, I, where we looked at helices of different flexibility, you see that there are a couple of data points here missing. And uh, for, so the dark blue is the most the floppiest helix. So at one point, Ricardo and I asked our John Costa, what, what, why don't you fill that in? And he said, simulation broke. So we've all had simulations breaking out. But what does it mean? So for the grad student, telling your advisor that it broke isn't enough. You gotta get more information. How did it break? Okay, so here's what happened. Here is a simulation of floppy helix being driven really fast. And so what you see, so it broke. But you see here, one thing that we see is classical buckling of the beam. Okay, so here, it's, it, it's very floppy and it was being around too quickly, and then it just buckles. Which, um, something that I found uh, pretty interesting is that just in, the, I, not this year, now it's last year, there is recent work on actual experiments of the buckling of bacterial flagella. So we're trying to, to see how our work um, actually with that. So what about, now I told you we wanted to now take this and put, put this in a tube. And so numerically, this gets a little bit hairier because as far as, as we know, there's no, funda there's, there's no fundamental solution for the Stokes equations in a cylinder. I'm looking at my applied math, my classical applied math friends. I, I'm, I, we are wishing that someone would say, oh yes, in 1942, <laughs> Professor so-and-so in Cambridge figured that one out. But, <clears throat> so what, what, you know, for, there, there's fundamental for, for Laplace's equation, you have Green's functions for outside of the sphere, <coughs> free space, not a two. So we actually have to discretize the two and go through an algorithm, which is it's, it's a little bit expensive, but we can. And here, um, ignore the fact that this tube seems to be moving. So, so imagine that's a fixed tube. And we take the same swimmer and put it in a of decreasing radius. And the finish line is here. And we see that, that the, the same flagella swims more quickly in, as the tube gets, gets smaller. Somehow, it's pushing off the, uh, this, the size of its thermine. And uh, this is something that for, so there, there's been no work recently on, on finite size helices in tubes. There's been some very nice work in five years ago by uh, Tom Powers group in Brown where they look at an infinitely long helix in an infinitely long tube. And it is known that uh, speed increases. So we could do the analysis and we can scale. Uh, we can scale the velocity and have some ideas of how the speed depends upon the tube radius. But in the examples that I showed you before, we took that helix, and the axis of the helix was aligned with the, the axis of the tube. So, one question that we asked is, what happens instead if we launch the swimmer? towards the tube wall. What's going to happen? Is it going to knock into the wall? Is it going to align itself? And again, I told you we like doing this for the images. So here is the question. What happens if the flagellum is launched at an angle? And it's hard to see, but this is a narrow tube. You're all supposed to appreciate that this is a cool movie <laughs> as this goes off to infinity. That little dot in front is the is is the virtual helix, the virtual cell body. So what's happening? So now here's an example with different tubes of different radii. Same, uh, the flagellum has the same stiffness 
We've suppressed here the forward motion just so we can see where the flagellum lies within the tube. And if you look in the, in the, in the largest tube, you see this is kind of traversing round and around. It's rolling around the tube. If you look at the narrowest tube, it's hard to tell from this angle, so I'll show you another angle. This is pretty crazy. It looks like there are snakes coming at you. <laughs> but, uh, so imagine this. You see there, there's the two, two dots where the rotlet is applied and the counter rotlet right in front of it. So if it was coming right down the center of the tube, those two dots, you would see as one. Okay. So maybe you can see that this, the smallest tube, he's actually centering. This one is not. In fact, for the largest tube, we have no um, repulsive forces. He, this, this run, at some point it actually kind of runs into the wall. If we try to quantify the trajectories as a function here of, of tube, uh, I should have stars on where all these started out, but look at this. If, if the counter outlet started out here in the, in the narrowest tube, we see, we, as we tra trace it, it's getting closer and closer to the center. In the largest tube, it started out here, and the helix is actually moving out towards the wall. Incredibly enough, there is a sweet spot right here at this radius where the counter rot rotlet just it, it just goes nicely around the tube, it doesn't spiral in and it doesn't spiral out. We have no idea about this. So if someone wants to do the analysis of this problem, please do this. So here I, I think it's really fascinating that there is this perfect uh, uh, relationship between the the radius of the, of the helix and the radius of the tube where they find a sweet spot. Now, why is it, ha why is it centering in the narrowness, in the most narrow tube? What we see is this. So, the helix, if the tube is narrow enough like this, in order to keep this, the, the the fluid velocity zero at the at the two walls. We compute the forces that must be exerted at points on the two wall in order to keep the velocity zero, and that large forces develop near the tail where it's near the wall. So, in some sense, this this flagellum is being guided in that direction to line up with the center line of the tube. If the tube is actually much bigger then the forces that are developed at the two wall are not, are not big enough to realign the, the helix. So we understand it a little bit. But what I what I want you so so at least you need to agree with me that this was a this was a cool warm-up problem, but there it just bring leaving biology aside, it brings up really interesting questions in fundamental low runnings number of fluid dynamics. So that's the nice thing about being in the math department. We're allowed to take those tangents and figure these things out. So what we want to do, of course, eventually is to take, uh, is to take multiple flagellum and tie them together and look at flagellar bundling and see how the confined environment changes that bundling. Of course, we want to couple that with, uh, with chemistry and so forth. So, uh, I, I hope I gave you, for, the, for that project, just some flavor of, of you know, having the, the motivation by, uh, having the research project motivated by a real problem and then taking it all in different directions. And I think that we are learning something. So I haven't spent any time at all talking about the, the numerical methods, how we try to make this faster and so on. So in the, in the, short time that I have left, I want to show you another really intriguing, well, uh, 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 another intriguing problem. And here, uh, the idea of synchrony comes up when one looks at, for instance, cilia and flagella. If you look at sperm under a microscope after a while, two sperm that come close together start waving 
days. Uh, here, this is, uh, I took this from a recent paper by, uh, a, by Ray Goldstein's group in Cambridge, which is really intriguing. There are, there are uh, algal cells that have uh, one, I, I think they could pull one, they're usually at two flagella, but, but there are, you can study algal cells with one flagella that feed in a mycelia, like power recovery stroke. And so, this, it, so these chlamydomonas type cells have typically have two flagella, and they beat an, an antiphase. So the question is, is it, is it fluid dynamics that's causing these flagella to be in phase, or is, there, is it because they're attached to the same cell that there's some communication in the cell that's telling them how to be? So in, in Ray's lab, he took two individual cells with flagella and held them by micropipettes close to each other and saw that for cells that were really close, the flagella tended to actually be in phase. And so they were, set, they were flagella from different cells. So there was hydrodynamic entrainment here. So, so there have been studies of very reduced models, not of the biological creature, but of colloids. And they are able to, also, these experiments are also out of Cambridge, looking at the synchronization of colloidal oscillators. So this is done by magnetic traps. So let me try to ex explain this to you. Here. So I'm saying this is a model that they could actually with a colloid, they can actually realize this. So here's the here's an object that's free to move in a fluid, and there are two traps related to this object. When this trap is active or turned on, there is a force. Think of it like a spring force or a magnetic. Think of it as a spring force. There is a force that is pulling this oscillator towards this. When this red object or this colloid gets within a threshold distance from the, from the active trap, this trap turns off, that one turns on. So here it got close, the dark blue one turns off, the other one becomes active, and it moves in that direction. But all of this is in a fluid. So you can imagine that you get some something, some object moving back and forth. You switch this guy on, it moves towards there, it gets close enough, this turns off, it switches back. Okay. So here, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of things from my student, Shan Chan's thesis. She's working for Regions Bank right now, discussing money laundering. Um, I'm sure this really prepared her for this. <laughs> So here is this, this red oscillator. I'm only showing you the active trap here. And you see this is going back and forth. So here, and, and here our object has some flexibility that I will talk about that. So we put this in a fluid. I'm not showing you this. But here, here is the question. And this is this, the, the experiment, so that, that paper that I showed you is just this. What happens now? If you take two colloids, put them next to two oscillators, put them next to each other, they each have their own set of flickering traps on and off, but they're coupled through a fluid. So suppose you start out two things, which both they're both moving towards the trap on this side, and they're identical in phase. Will they just oscillate back and forth? What was this, what what is stable? So this is a simulation in Stokes flow. Here, this is two D. So each of these red ones want to move to, towards their active trap. Whether or not a trap is active depend. This is active based only upon how close its colloid is to it. It's the, the activity only depends on 
on that one system, but they're feeling forces through the whole fluid. So, we, so this simulation starts out, each one of these objects is the same distance from its active trap. Once it, but watch what happens here. Well, let's, let's do it like this. Don't get dizzy. Okay, so the blues are just showing you which trap is active. But look at the the red the red colloids are the objects that we're tracking. So what happened? They didn't stay in synchrony. They almost immediately went to opposite phase. When Shan Shan showed me this, I told her there was a bug in the code. She's wrong. It can't possibly be because you ch changed the indices. And she insisted, and she was right. So this is this is this is. Let me tell you what's happening. Which one reaches first? So by whatever numerical breeze there is, or, or error, or one of them gets close, gets within threshold, one time step before the other. So what happens? This is Stokes flow. There is no inertia. There is no memory. So here, let's see what happens. I'll let this go again. Uh, here, the one here, this one reached its trap first and was then immediately pulled towards the other trap. So even though the other guy was almost at his trap location, the big force that came from the other guy going to its opposite trap didn't allow it to get there. And so almost immediately we, we get this anti-phase. <coughs> Um, oscillation. Now, this is the, the insanity of Stokes' flow. There's zero inertia. So even, so even though um, right at the start, the beginning, the guy of that side, he was almost where he wanted to go. But he didn't remember which way he was going because there's no memory in Stokes' flow. So basically, here, and, you know, I'll just show you some cool movies. So here we have this sort of thing where we put in different configurations. So even, even when we don't have them along the line, the oscillators, but in parallel, you see the antiphase is quickly approached here. And then we could play these games. What if you have three? And I'm, this is where people start saying, I can't look at this anymore, it's too busy. <laughs> but you know, there are, you, you see that the one neighbors are in anti-phase and the opposite ones are, are in phase. So does this here explain ciliary synchrony, synchrony of cilia? This is a toy model and one can question how much information you get. What, just to, to conclude, what, what Shan Shan did was to take this system and instead of using Stokes equations, use Navier-Stokes. And so for a very small amount of, of inertia, we still saw that antiphase was, was uh, equilibrium. But if we added a, a little bit more inertia, we saw that the equilibrium was in phase. Because as soon as one guy switched, the other guy had memory of which way it was going, a little inertia got him to, to that spot. So these are simple questions that, you know, simple observations that after the fact you understand what's happening. So I will end here, but just to say that what we did was we took these ideas and not, instead of thinking about cilia as, as, as circles or dots, we looked at elastic beams with the same sort of threshold switching, and I will just show you here, because I, I want to get you even dizzier, <laughs> is that with these sticks here, the same thing happens. If you look at this for a while, these cilia are um, in opposite phase. Now that's not what happens in biology. Cilia that are next to each other, they pretty much phase lock, and then you get a nice metachromal wave. So this threshold switching is not the answer.
but you get some idea. Like, I'm glad you agree. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time to have some questions. Yeah. Is it known in the biological cases, like the bacteria, if the if the different flagella in a bundle all have the same elasticity? Um. Yeah, it is known, and I'm, I'm hiding something from you. The bacterial flagella are basically rigid. They're much more rigid than what I showed here. So I was thinking more. That the that helix in the simulations that I showed, I was thinking that as being more representative of the bundle. So there are there 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 are some studies that the bacterial flagella are basically rigid, but they, they do have some phase changes if you if you spin them fast enough. But they pretty much are about the, the same rigidity for bacteria. For eukaryotic flagella, that's a whole other story. Or algal for the flagella. I have a follow-up question. Will they have the same stiffness along the entire flagella? No. What happens if you change the stiffness along the flagella? That's a good. Yes, I, I, uh, that's a good project for a grad student. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So your your simulations of the flagella you were you starting with? Um, with the shape? Started out in equilibrium shape, yeah. Determined by what? Is that just what's observed mm -hmm. in a lot of systems? Is yeah. that a vessel function? What, is, what, what do you have? Well, we just made, we, we looked, we, we just chose a shape that had pretty much the same radius at the end and the right tapering. So yeah, we looked at biological data, but we just pretty much made it up. We could change the geometry. Yeah. So the other thing in your cell problem, what is known about how these cells communicate with each other? If you have the two cells next to each other, is it known if there's any kind of yeah. communication of any sort? So with the algal cells, yeah. well, the the idea is that um, well, if they're so no, the, if these are just free swimming cells, they're com the only communication is through the fluid, unless you think I mean, there's, there's some biochemical. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is there some chemical signaling that I, I you know that that in the long run that could be, but no, they they go through pains to ignore that, but. For, but for two flagella in a single one of these algal cells, they think that there is an elastic linkage between the two. Mm -hmm. So within a cell. But for separate algal cells, I think you're pretty safe in those experiments to think that they're not, they're only communicating through the business world. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one question. For the very last simulation with the Nabors Dose equation, the when they're close to interacting, they they jump. I'm sort of curious about uh, the momentum equation. Okay, there. so they're not. So the, the thing that you see that jumping yeah. isn't really in the physical system. It's just where the force is. So it's like this magnet. I'm just depicting where we're putting that force. So the so I went through this really quickly. So the the this this the red object is the thing in the system. That's the that's the physical object. A force, it, it feels a force turned on by the dark blue object. It's like a spring that gets attached to it and it wants to have rest length zero. So the thing that, that you see flicks on and off, as this, as this object gets closer and closer and closer here, we're monitoring its position, and when it gets close enough, we turn off that force to zero and we apply another force here. So, so, so that field was the force field, not the that velocity. That was the force. The dark blue things were the force field, okay. and so the we're, we're like turning a switch on and off, a magnet on and off. I was going to you mentioned briefly about the cell bodies, but what I guess I'm thinking about the geometry of the cell body or the side of the cell body. How does that play into? That's a good question. So you know, here we have this virtual cell body. 
bacteria. Oh, they're, they're all different sized cell bodies. So how? So you know, a cell body certainly would introduce drag to the system, so it wouldn't swim as fast, and it would require more work. But uh, how the, the the details of how how swimming energetics and velocity depend on cell bodies. That's something for some other graduate students. <laughs> So could this um, analysis of how these things are moving somehow be applied to, like, it, like in the long run, like infertility treatment and like like viewing, uh, you know, because you had put the video of how the sperm are moving. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to maybe like figure out yeah. how to alter like somebody's biology to make their sperm more viable, like in that's, cases with fertility? That's, uh, yeah, that would be the hope. And, when, you, when one writes a grant proposal, that would be <laughs> <laughs> So the unfortunate thing is that there's not, the NIH has stopped investing much in, in sperm motility studies because you don't need motile sperm anymore. Sorry, everybody. I want to start that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, because now, so when was in vitro, when was the first in vitro fertilization? years ago? 40 years ago? 40 years ago? Okay, so there you have an egg on a dish, you take sperm, and they had to be motile in order to, uh, in order to fertilize the egg. But now there are mechanisms where you just take, even if the sperm flagellum is lazy and miserable, you could just take the cell body and fertilize. <laughs> so maybe, it, maybe instead of fertility treatments, maybe birth control would be a better way to take to go. Yeah. Hindering them more than helping them. I'm gonna. You're, you're filming me. This is a Jane response. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is still. I, I shouldn't say that. So for human applications, it's not all that interesting uh, to funding agencies. But for um, for uh, commercial interests, like. Uh, Cattle sperm is really um, important for that. So I know that there are colleagues at Imperial College London who are doing sperm motility studies, and they're getting funded by, by those kind of agencies. Yeah, so when you had the magnet with the two switching on immediately, so what determines like the pull strength? Is it a function of the like distance squared? Or yeah. So think. So the. So it think about it like a spring. So there's a stiffness constant times the distance. So yeah. To so there I was using quadratic potentials. So there, there, there are there, there. If you look, that's really condensed matter physics. There's a lot of interesting work done in the past ten years. So if the force was from a cubic potential, for instance, the equilibrium. The equilibrium configuration is not antiphase; it's in phase. So it's not. I I, I didn't talk. You know, I, I didn't discover this problem. So there there's been studies on that, but I haven't seen anywhere where anybody's actually in, introduced inertia. Yeah, let's take Lisa.